Today, we're going to talk about the Battle of the Nine Penny Kings, also known as the Fifth and Final Blackfire Rebellion. And really, the consequences from the war are far more important than the actual war, which we're going to talk about at the end of this video. So first, the Battle of the Nine Penny Kings. In 258 AC, nine people joined forces to form the Band of Nine, later known as the Nine Penny Kings, when Duncan, Aegon V's son, said that crowns were being sold nine a penny. These nine individuals were Old Mother, a pirate queen, Samaro San, the last Valerian, a notorious pirate from a notorious family of pirates, Zobar Kukwa, the Ebon Prince, an exile prince from the Summer Isles, Lyamon Lasher, the Lord of Battles, a famed sellsword captain, Spotted Tom, the Butcher, from Westeros, captain of a free company in the disputed lands. Sir Derek Fossaway, the Bad Apple, an exile from Westeros, a knight with a black reputation. Nine Eyes, captain of the Jolly Fellows. Lico Adaris, the Silver Tongue, a Tyroshi merchant prince, ambitious and wealthy. And then finally, Mally's Blackfire, the Monstrous, captain of the Golden Company. These individuals were mostly business owners or merchants who wanted to carve out their own kingdom so that they could have lands, subjects, and consequently more money. Malice the Monstrous, being the last male Blackfire descendant of Damon Blackfire, agreed to also be in the group and bring his golden company to help carve out, carve out these kingdoms, only if they also helped him eventually take Westeros. So the Band of Nine or the Nine Penny Kings were just formed together because they all agreed that they want to carve out kingdoms for themselves and make more money. So that's the general gist of it, and then Melee's is like, hey, I'll help you, I have a golden company, but you're going to help me take Westeros. And the Nine Penny Kings were very smart about their plan. Instead of attacking a free city, they instead took the disputed land, which had divided control by Mir, Tyrosh, and Lys. So the northern free cities were separate from the disputed land, so it would be harder for the more northern free cities to come down and attack the dis disputed land and the Band of Nine. After seizing the disputed lands, they moved on to Tyrosh. This was another great move since Tyrosh was a port city and the Nine Petty Kings had a very, very strong naval force. So they're fighting in Essos and achieving these victories and Aegon V is on the throne when this first happens and he's really hoping that the free cities of Essos would take care of them. They would just be kind of smushed down and that would be the end of it. So why didn't the Free Cities squash this band of nine that was going through and conquering the disputed lands in Tyrosh and basically setting themselves up? The most likely reason is distance. The disputed lands were cut off from the northern Free Cities. Also another reason was probably the inability to cooperate. We know that certain Free Cities disagreed over slavery and wouldn't be too keen on helping the other opposing view. So none of the free cities would really cooperate or agree to how they would attack or where they would attack or what's more important or I'm just not going to agree with you because you have slaves and I don't believe in that. And so the Nine Penny Kings just kept going. And Aegon V, before this happened and before he died, had started making a plan to take care of them and was bringing lords together and kind of creating his own band of nine in a way by bringing lords together and being like, you know, this is this is what we're going to do. But for now, he kind of just sat on it. And so next, the Nine Petty Kings take the Stepstones and Aegon V is dead. Now his son, Jaehaerys II, is on the throne. And when they take the Stepstones, this is a big oh no moment, as Jaehaerys II knows that taking the Stepstones is an excellent launch point for taking on Westeros next. And Jaehaerys II isn't stupid. He may have been very ill, and we'll actually talk about him more next Sunday and fill in more of the blanks with what exactly Jaehaerys II is doing at this time. But he may have been ill, but he's not stupid. He's very brave and very intelligent, and he knows Melee's the monstrous. The last male Blackfire wants the throne. And his father's gone, but his father's plans aren't gone, and he decides to enact those. Even though his eldest brother, Duncan, is gone, and his youngest brother, who is a splendid knight and could have helped him, is also gone, Jaehaerys II just decides he's going to enact his father's plan, and he isn't waiting for the Nine Penny Kings to get to Westeros. So instead, in 260 AC, he decides to launch a preemptive strike and sends armies to three of the Stepstones. Some notable names in the army are Brendan Tully, Gerald... Hightower, Tywin Lannister, who's newly knighted, Barristan Selmy, Ares II Targaryen, Ormon and Stefan Baratheon, Rickard Stark, 
and the current Lord Greyjoy. The lords and their men set to the stepstones, and the regional wardens being activated, this is at first almost an assured victory. Lord Ormond Baratheon, Hand of the King, leads the army, but is quickly cut down and dies in his son, Stephen Baratheon's arms. The new commander is Sir Hightower, the White Bull. When the battle is at its height, and neither side is really sure who would win, Sir Barristan Selmy himself cuts through the Golden Company and ends up slaying Malley's the monstrous in single combat. With Malley's dead, the rest of the Nine Petty Kings slip away since they had no real interest in Westeros. So killing him really is the deciding blow, and Barristan Selmy is pretty much a, a living legend at this point. And with Maelie's the Monstrous dead, the last male heir of the Blackfires is also dead. And finally, Aegon IV, the Unworthy's curse, was lifted off the realm. So that's the end of the fifth and final Blackfire Rebellion. First, I want to point out that George R. R. Martin loves history and says he models a lot of his book off our own historical events. In the past, wars have been a way to bind people in ways other life events just can't do. Look at the Mexican-American War. A lot of young men served in these battles for the first time and they bonded and they learned lessons that later affected the Civil War. And a lot of what happened in the Civil War with the military and politics was started in the Mexican-American War. We also have the War of 1812, which united America in politics for almost a decade. And then we also have the Hundred Year War, which completely changed the politics of England and France. And there's so many more examples in our own history of how war changes the political landscape. So now the Battle of the Nine Petty Kings, we have powerful houses uniting in battle, making friends with each other, learning lessons, and just in general bonding over the shared experience. And what is the good takeaway from this battle? The Targaryens need us more than we need them. If we hadn't bonded together to help the throne, they would have lost it. And with how some of the lords felt about Aegon V being a tyrant, even though he really wasn't, but he was taking away a lot of their rights and rules, which you can learn more about if you watch our Aegon V video, why would they want to keep being ruled by people like that when they know how powerful they are when they combine together? This war directly showed what they were capable of together. So here are a few consequences of the war broken down by House. House Lannister. Tywin Lannister went to war newly knighted, but his able-bodied father, Tytos, did not. Instead, he stayed with his mistress while his brother, Jason Lannister, led 10,000 Westerland soldiers. Tywin went to war, and during these battles, Tywin quickly realized, and in a very harsh way, how his house was viewed, weak and needing the throne to step into the Westerlands to take care of their issues. The Battle of the Nine Petty Kings changed Tywin, who already was pretty tired of his father's inability to rule, and made him more bitter and a hardened man. When the battle was won, Tywin was dead set on restoring his house name and honor, and his actions to do so led to the Rain Tarbeck Rebellion, and we know how that went. The Reigns of Castamir is a song that still strikes fear in people's hearts when played. Tywin brought his house up to be respected and feared. And this is a direct result of his hardened battle experiences and what he learned with the Nine Penny King's War. Also of note, Tywin knighted Ares II, and due to their bonding during the battles, would be the Mad King's future hand. House Tully. One of the biggest results was House Tully becoming acquainted with, in some way, to Peter Baelish's father during the war. Whether Lord Baelish ended up saving the Lord Tully's life, or they just became fast friends, we don't know. But we do know the result. Hoster Tully agrees to raise Lord Baelish's son, Peter, at River Run as his ward. This is a huge honor for a lesser house to be taken in as a ward for a higher house. Here, Peter Baelish becomes infatuated with Catelyn Tully, and who knows how deep this love for her drives Peter Baelish in his current and past Westeros plans. Also a consequence in regard to House Tully is Brendan Tully, who became a lot more emboldened after fighting in the war and a lot more stubborn, I would say. And he came home and he refused to marry Bethany Redwine, the woman his elder brother, Huster Tully, had picked for him to make House Tully even more powerful. Brendan Tully's refusal to marry her strained the relationship between the brothers, leading to Brendan Tully to be called the Blackfish and taking his personal sigil to be the Tully sigil, but instead of a silver trout jumping, it was a black trout. Since he couldn't reconcile with his brother, he went with his niece, Lysa Tully, to the Vale of Arryn. 
For his loyal service to House Aaron, Lord John Aaron named him Knight of the Gate, a super big honor in the Vale. So the war changes him and makes him a harder, more stubborn man that eventually plays a big role when the North ends up rebelling and is led by Rob and Catelyn Stark. House Baratheon The Lord of House Baratheon, Ormond Baratheon, dies in the arms of his son, Stephen Baratheon. Ormond was also the Hand of the King, married to a Targaryen, and led the forces, which was a huge honor. So right there we see the tie between House Targaryen and House Baratheon is pretty strong at this point. Stephen obviously would still have these ties to the Targaryens, but once he dies and young Robert Baratheon is sent to the Vale to be taken care of by John Arryn, he meets his friend and one day greatest ally Ned Stark. Stephen's early death severs that tie between the Baratheons and the Targaryens, and Robert no longer has that strong sense of loyalty that his father and grandfather had. So Orman Baratheon dying quite possibly led to this chain effect of things that Stefan did and then him dying early and kind of severing those Targaryen Baratheon ties. House Aaron. John Aaron would have bonded and interacted with all the Starks, Baratheons, Tullys, and Lannisters. This bond most likely aided in Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon being fostered by John Aaron. Also, due to this closeness, John Aaron is the first to call his banners against the Mad King and refuses to hand over Robert or Ned. And obviously his relationship with Hoster Tully helps the marriage packs go smoother so that they can have the Riverlands at their back in the fight in Robert's Rebellion. House Stark. There aren't a lot of direct results except for being obviously a ward for John Aaron and obviously the friendships made. There is also a theory that the Starks started marrying more out of the North than usual due to these friendships built during the war. Selmy Barristan, for his valor on the in the war and killing Melis the Monstrous, eventually becomes a Kingsguard and then Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. He ends up giving his family seat and the woman he's wed to for it. His experiences in the Battle of the Nine Petty Kings lifted him up to be a legend to become this great fighter and then join the Kingsguard and be Lord Commander and then be dismissed and then eventually go over and start helping out Daenerys. And then finally, the Targaryens. Besides the obvious friendships between the houses deepening and the houses seeing how powerful they are together, the Fifth Blackfire Rebellion, along with the stress of running the realm and dealing with all the issues from Aegon the Fifth's reign, Jaehaerys II probably had a ton of stress on him, which exacerbated his illness, possibly leading to his short three-year rule and death. So in conclusion, the Battle of the Nine Petty Kings forged friendships and awareness in the houses that would play a role and shape in the future of Westeros, and specifically about 25 years later in Robert's Rebellion. So join us next week when we talk about Jaehaerys II, which ties in also to this Fifth Blackfire Rebellion. Otherwise, come back on Wednesday when we have a random Game of Thrones video, and make sure you like and subscribe.